thank you for having me here. I want to thank the school. Thank you all for coming. When is spring break? Is it soon? <laughs> Next week. Impressive. Really impressive. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Dean Lyons for inviting me and Joe for that lovely introduction. It's good to be here. It's good to be at a school. We're going to talk a lot today about what's just and right. So it's good to be at a place that I think does a lot of that, thinks so deeply about um, what's right, what's just, is, has a history of activism, even in the B school, right? Even in, in as you get your <laughs> MBA. Um, so let's start. I'm going to try to leave some time for questions at the end. So I might go through a couple of these sort of quickly, because um, we're getting started. This is me at Climate Week. That's my husband. That's uh, Michelle DePass, my dear friend, who's also dean, one of the deans at the New School in New York City. I like to start it, I like to always start with something about being excited about this, this field. This is my passion. And um, I think uh, the most important thing is that at Apple and all through my career, I have been fortunate to be able to pursue my passion wherever I am. And so I hope you leave here today feeling pretty passionate about Climate Week. This was actually at New York City's Climate Week, as it says. You know, 400,000 people, I think, they said, marched that day. That's the climate march. Uh, the other person who was there in March was uh, CEO, our CEO, Tim Cook. He was there specifically to address the role of business um, and business leadership in tackling climate change, which, of course, is a, a global problem. Um, and so we're going to delve into that. I think it's really relevant, especially for you here at Haas. Um, how can corporations lead the way? on the challenges of our time. But I'm always asked to do a little bit of biography, uh, so bear with me. There's a point to some of this, and the rest won't be on the test, I promise you. Um, I grew up in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. That's where my journey started. I was really good at math and science um, in school. Um, and my dad was a postman, uh, so he was a public servant, a civil servant. Um, I grew up seeing that. My mom was what we would today call an executive assistant. She would say I was a secretary. Um, I actually, because I was good in math and science, um, uh, ended up going to Tulane University and, uh, as you heard, majoring in chemical engineering. But um, I just want you to know that uh, maybe in foreshadow of my current job, it was this very, very cool uh, electronic device that actually got me to go to Tulane University. Um, if you were good at math and science, they offered you an opportunity to come in the summer to learn what engineering was about. I had no idea what an engineer did when I was a junior in high school. Um, and if you went, if you spent six weeks of your life in the, in the summer, it got a <laughs> Yes, it's the Texas Instruments Programmable Calculator. Don't laugh back then. It was like getting an iPad Air for free. Six weeks of my life, I'll take it. Um, look at the features. Come on, it could do sine and cosine. <laughs> All right, you're good. So you're with me now. So here I am, I got my calculator. I decided to not be a doctor, which is what I thought I would be, and instead go into this field of engineering. It was actually the idea that there was an entire field um, around the idea of solving problems. That really got me going. If you ask an engineer, I know you don't talk to many of them. Try it every once in a while. Um, engineers in the house, I know there's at least a couple here. Thank you very much. Um, well, you know, what does our discipline do? It's about solving problems. And I really got into the idea that um, solving problems was really important. Um, and so I stopped wanting to be a doctor and started wanting to be an engineer. And then while I was in school, the country was grappling with um, this newfound problem that it had, which was all these hazardous waste sites all over the country. And for me, um, and for a lot of Americans of my generation, the place that that became really clear to us was a place called Love Canal. Love Canal is in upstate New York, not far from Buffalo. Um, it was a canal dug by a man named Mr. Love. I think his first name was Alfred. He thought, you know what, I'm going to dig a canal. I'm going to take advantage of the hydropower here. It's not far from Niagara Falls, a lot of, lot of energy there. He didn't get very far, though, and then he went bankrupt, and he was trying to figure out how to get some of his money back. And so for pretty much very little money, he offered the chemical companies in the area to come and fill up the hole he had dug uh, with goop. Chemical goop is um, the unscientific term, and they did. 
Um, and then they filled in the rest with dirt. They kind of covered it over. This is actually years later after they had started to uh, find the problem. And then it started to rain. And over time, people came and moved. You can see houses in the background around what was then the canal. And when it rained, eventually, the goop never solidified. It just sort of got spread out by the water pressure and eventually found its way into people's basements. And all of a sudden, the country was confronted with a problem that it didn't know it had, which are all these, now we know, tens of thousands of toxic waste sites around the country. And we had no mechanism for cleaning it up. There was no Superfund law. There was no RECRA law. And so that's kind of what was happening when I was in school. And this is, um, this is the only part of this whole long story, which is I remember being a, in, in college and studying to be a chemical engineer. And chemical engineers, by the way, are the ones who design and perfect the processes of making chemicals. But there are byproducts. I call it goop. But there's chemical waste that comes out, of the, out as a byproduct. And I thought to myself, if a chemical engineer can design the process to make all that um, chemistry and push our country forward economically in that way, it really should be our responsibility for figuring out how to clean this up and eventually, hopefully, to prevent it. And that was the beginning of my environmentalism. I tell that story because I think a lot of times, especially if you're fortunate enough to spend any time in California or some of the beautiful places in our country, you think environmentalists are people who wear Birkenstocks and spend, spend most of their time outside. Until this very year, no, last year, I had never slept outside because I didn't grow up in Cowboy. And I used to tell them, I don't sleep outside. I don't do it. <laughs> the women at Apple found out and made me go camping. So now I really, really like it. But um, I, do <laughs> I do want you to know that um, it doesn't mean uh, environmentalists are born sometimes because of the blight that our society creates, not only because of the beauty. Um, that we're all fortunate to experience. Um, so I'm an engineer. Most engineers go to work in the private sector. But even back then, clearly, I thought I wanted to do something to leave things better than I found it. This is out of chronological order, um, because this is my same hometown after Hurricane Katrina. I put it up there. Um, it doesn't really have that much to do with the talk, except we're going to talk a lot about climate change. Um, that's, you could probably almost see my house, uh, or what maybe the roof of my house in that picture. Uh, that's going towards New Orleans East and East and Ninth Ward. Uh, my mom lost her home in Hurricane Katrina, and as did everybody in our neighborhood. Um, she didn't lose her life, which was a lot more than we can say for a lot of people. But this, this picture for me is not just about the science of climate change, but the human cost, the economic cost of climate change and the cost in justice, um, because um, in some ways, New Orleans being hit as early as it was was a wake up call not only for the city but the country. But there were pledges, and there have been lots of money and effort spent to make New Orleans whole again. Um, and you know, if this keeps happening, not just to New Orleans, but Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Ruth and you know, tornadoes and typhoons all around the world, we're going to run out of the money to make cities whole again. So it's really a story about justice and about rights and about fairness that we're confronting when we talk about climate. All right, back to my journey. Here I am. I graduate from school. I actually uh, go to graduate school at Princeton. I'm going to skip that for just a second. But my first really big job ended up being in Washington, D.C. That's the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency building in Washington, D.C. Um, I started in, at EPA as a staff level engineer in 1987. And um, in 2009, um, President Obama asked me to, 2008, he asked me to run the place. And by 2009, that's exactly what I was doing. Um, I think. Um, I'll just say about being a public servant that you know there is no higher calling in my mind um, than uh, serving our country. And one of the things I worry about a lot, and maybe we'll have time to talk about in Q&A, is that our best and brightest folks like you are not going that way, because there's been so much said about public servants. But the vast majority of the people I met all along my career, both in New Jersey and New York and then in DC, were some of the hardest working, brightest people I knew. And they were following their passion, which, as, I, as you remember, I think is really important. Um, one of the things I love to do, I used to run an enforcement program for many years in New Jersey and at EPA, 
was to go beyond what's required. The companies I loved to work with, and there are many of them out there, would come in and they'd have an enforcement problem, a compliance problem, and they wouldn't just come in trying to figure out how to make us look bad and them look good. They would say, okay, let's figure out how to end up with not just what you want me to do, but let's talk about what's possible. Where can we innovate? Where can we find something that actually, if we can figure it out, leaves things better than we found it? And those are kind of the, the really important lessons um, from, from uh, that time. Now, people always ask me, what was your favorite thing at EPA? Definitely the endangerment finding, the finding we made that said greenhouse gas pollution was endangering uh, public health and welfare, the basis for the climate, the clean power plan that's out there now, the basis for the car and truck rules that are out there now. Um, I, uh, you know, I, there's, there's talk about changing what's possible. I mean, I think part of what we tried to do the whole time we were there was keep raising the bar, for asking the question, answering it, and every time we answer it, coming up with a do, new definition of what's possible. My last day at EPA was February 14, 2013, so two years ago, um, Valentine's Day. And um, that building that you saw is, was, back in the day, the um, home of the US Postal Service. And so there were lots of lessons in that for EPA. But for me, there was um, the reminder of my father, because remember, he was a postman. And so every day when I would go to work, I would have to cross over the seal of the post office. And every day, I thank my father for the gift of public service that he gave me. All right, so now I leave public service, and I go clear across the country to uh, Cupertino, California. There she blows. There's uh, one infinite loop. Um, I immediately went from being a regulator to being regulated. I immediately went from having about 17,000 people working for me to like 17, more or less. Um, and thank heavens, I finally got my iMac on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, the biggest change of all was I went from being an environmental leader. There's no change. I'm still an environmental leader. That's the point. You know, that's that's what I hope you take from this. You know, I wasn't going to change my stripes. Tim certainly knew that. Um, so why did I choose Apple? Uh, a couple things. I heard in my interviews, and I hear every day at Apple, the thing I firmly believe, which is that you do not have to choose between a thriving economy, economic growth, and a thriving uh, environment. I really believe that. When people kind of assume that, oh, that's naive, um, I say that's because you're not creative. It's not naive. You're not creative. You're not being innovative. You suffer from a lack of innovation if you can't figure out how to do both. And in fact, many of the answers are right in front of us. We'll see a couple of them. Um, Apple walks the walk. That's another reason I went there. I wasn't going to go somewhere to be the former head of the EPA and give green cover to a company that wasn't really about doing something. They go beyond, we go, beyond what's required. Um, and we are constantly challenging the boundaries of what's possible. Um, my job at Apple is kind of fun. The reason I only have a small number of staff, it's definitely bigger than 17, is that um, we made a decision to keep the business units that, or the business, the parts of our businesses that work on environment where they sit. So the people who do product design and engineering, we leave the environmental team there because we didn't want to bring them all to one central place and then be sort of an add-on to the business process. The people who do clean energy are still located in our um, facilities group. And um, that's, you know, they're, that's where they're in the, the best position to make impacts as we're making decisions, whether it's about a new data center or a new building or a new facility or a new retail store. So <coughs> I kind of like that. I think my job then becomes, yes, part strategy, part this idea that the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. There's all these great things happening at Apple. How do we put that into a coherent strategy? How do we make sure that it's all bigger um, than the sum of the parts? Now, um, Tim always says, if you ever um, hear him speak, um, that we want to leave the world better than we found it. We focus, we simplify, we focus and simplify on a couple of big ideas. Um, you, go, you guys probably have seen, well, some of you may have seen this before, um, but it bears watching one more time. Um, just check it out. Better. It's a powerful word and a powerful ideal. It makes us look at the world and want more than anything to change it for the better. 
to innovate, improve, to reinvent, to make it better. It's in our DNA. And better can't be better if it doesn't consider everything, our products, our values, and an even stronger commitment to the environment for the future, to use greener materials, less packaging, to do everything we can to keep our products out of landfills, changes that will benefit people as well as the planet. To us, better is a force of nature. It drives us to build things we never imagined. New data centers powered by the sun and wind, a new manufacturing facility that runs on 100% clean energy, and new product designs that make use of recycled materials, all ways to reduce our impact on the environment. We have a long way to go and a lot to learn. But now, more than ever, we will work to leave the world better than we found it and make the tools that inspire others to do the same. So that voice is Tim's. I, I like to point that out. If you're at Apple, everyone knew. But um, it was really important to us to get someone who sounded authentic. He, he sounded the most authentic out of everyone who read it. Um, and that was, that was uh, filmed almost entirely, pretty much all of it, at our data center in Maiden, North Carolina. All right, so what do we do? We have three priorities. We focus and simplify at Apple. We don't do everything. Our first priority is to use clean energy and energy efficiency to take care of our impact on our planet's changing climate. Our second is to use greener chemistry to um, remove toxins from our products and our processes. And our third is to be very, very frugal with the resources that our planet has through things like recycling. We'll talk about in a second. This is, uh, if you go, um, if you want more of anything I'm saying, go to our website, apple.com slash environment. Um, and if you went there and you clicked on the climate change piece, this is what you would see. Climate change is a real problem. Uh, we don't think that's revolutionary. Um, so we're taking real action. Um, a few years ago, Apple's management decided um, that we should be renewably powered as a corporation. So what happens when Apple puts the brain power of all those innovative people to that task? Well, in 2010, a couple years after they started, they were at 35%. Um, by 2012, 75%, and then I joined the company last year, but when we reported on our work by last year, we're at 94%. So that's our data centers, that's all our corporate facilities, um, and we still have that 6% to go. And believe me, if Tim could make us get to 105%, he would make us get to 105% as well. Um, there's real innovation in how we do that, um, this is, these are things as varied as, you know, our big campus is down in Cupertino, our um, facilities in Cork, which include business facilities, but also a, a manufacturing facility, our offices in Munich, um, and our data centers. This is our data center in Maiden, North Carolina. Um, <clears throat> as you heard in the video, every single one of Apple's data centers runs on 100% clean energy. You saw all those solar panels were what run this data center. So I want you to think for a second about what that means. You know, that means all the, every day through this data center, billions of um, iMessages and texts, um, and uh, millions of iPhotos that people are, are sharing, and hundreds of thousands of uh, chats, video chats via FaceTime. All going through this data center, it's the way we live our lives, but Without even thinking about it, we're living our lives in a lower carbon way because we're not adding to climate pollution in the atmosphere. There's a lot of innovation here for us engineers in the audience. There's 110,000 solar panels there, enough to power about 14,000 homes in North Carolina. Um, one of our, uh, we, have, we have a bunch of principles that we use when we do this, but one of them is additionality. The idea that we don't want to use up clean energy when we show up somewhere. We want to build new additional clean energy. So we're adding to the stock of clean energy available on the grid. And we want to do that in a way that doesn't impact ratepayers. These are fuel cells. Think of big batteries. 
Fuel cells run on natural gas, but these run on biogas, which is the only kind of natural gas um, that is considered to be um, classified as renewable energy as well. So we have um, 40 megawatts of solar and 10 megawatts of fuel cells here. This is just to give you a sense of how you have to think about um, energy for a data center. If you really want to run it on solar, you first have to make it really efficient because the cleanest energy and the cheapest is the energy you don't have to use. This data center, you saw it had a white roof. It's a, actually a LEED certified data center. I think it was the first one um, around. And that um, translates to the fact that in North Carolina, about 75% of the time, they're not using air conditioning to keep those servers in that data center cool. Most of the time, it's a lot of air, outside air moving through the data center. When they need to cool it, they pass that air over chilled water. So you're seeing one of the water tanks that holds that chilled water. They chill it at night when it's really easy to keep it cold, I mean to chill it, and then they put it in these huge tanks and use it during the hot part of the day so that they don't have to turn on uh, mechanical cooling. This is um, our data center outside of Reno, Nevada. It's gonna, it runs right now on geothermal, but very shortly we're gonna be switching over to solar power. This is um, a new solar technology called C7. What you're looking at are actually very photogenic mirrors. They're not solar panels. Those little mirrors are focusing energy down to pretty small silicon panels, solar panels that you can't see. Uh, right in front of them, and so they're much more efficient and um, generate a lot more power than the flat solar panels that you'll see other places. Um, we are, I think, the first to use this technology commercially. Um, kind of fun story, the utility there is called NV Energy, Nevada Energy. Um, they actually asked us, although they're a utility, to build and operate the farm in the beginning because they didn't have any experience, and they know we did from North Carolina. Uh, we have Oregon, where we're soon going to be powering um, our facilities um, through uh, the power of water, micro-hydro power is called, that runs through irrigation channels uh, outside of Prineville, Oregon. And this is the announcement Tim made at the Goldman Sachs Investor Conference a couple of weeks ago. He announced that we had um, entered into a power purchase agreement, $848 million, I think, um, with um, First Solar who's gonna take uh, about 3%, 3,000 acres of this beautiful ranch, uh, which is the California Flats property outside of Monterey. Um, and it's a sustainable ranch right now. They're thrilled because we're gonna generate power here. There are already power lines there. It's enough power to power our new campus as well as our 52 retail stores in California, as well as our data center. We have a data center in Newark, California. Uh, two weeks ago, Tim was in Europe and announced that we're building two new data centers, one in Ireland and one in Denmark, and they will be 100% renewable from day one. There, we're looking at a lot of wind power. All right, but we still have work to do, um, and now you get gratuitous shots of beautiful Apple stores around the world. Uh, this is our store on Fifth Avenue, which does run on 100% renewable. But think about retail. I mean, I'm sure many of you do, being in the business school. Retail stores, even for us, are pretty hard. We don't always control the meter. We're oftentimes tenants. Uh, we may or may not have access to the kind of clean power you can buy, and that's um, accountable uh, here in California. So we have work to do. Um, but even saying that, about half of our stores in the U.S. now are running on renewable. All of our stores in Australia are running on renewable. And we have some plans to try to bring stores around the world up. Uh, that is our store in Santa Monica. I think that's Promenade. Uh-oh, that's the store in Stanford. Can I say Stanford here at Berkeley? It's Palo Alto. Um, well, we, you know, so we, we're working hard. Watch our space around our retail stores. That's her, that's the mothership. That's the new campus that's being planned down in uh, Cupertino. Um, it's really the most energy efficient building of its kind. It's about 30, it uses about 30% less energy than a typical R&D building. A lot of people think of you know, this as an office building, but really if you spend any time around Apple, you do get the sense that you're in an R&D type facility. Lots of labs, not chemical labs, but lots of labs. Think of all your friends who are in EECS. 
Um, that's what's going on a lot of times, or a lot of fabrication and other type things. So about 30% less than an R&D facility. Um, natural ventilation, about 75% of the year. I'm going to geek out on you one more time. So they have these huge louvers that they've built and a system that draws in huge amounts of the outside air. The climate's pretty good down in Cupertino. Um, and then there's... Um, concrete that makes up the walls of the building and embedded in there are pipes that carry cool water. So when you take all that air and you pass it over cool concrete, the air gets cooled on the way into the building so that 75% um, of the time you don't have to worry about artificial conditioning of the air. So, and it makes for a pretty nice experience um, because you get lots and lots of fresh air through the building. Um, it's on property that belonged to HP. When HP owned the property, it was about 20% uh, unpaved, about 80% paved. Because of this unique design, um, we're planting about 7,000 trees and we're flipping that. It'll be about 20% impervious and the rest will be open space. It'll run on 100% renewable and that California Plat Flats project that we just looked at will be part of the answer. Um, the other part are the, what you see on the roof. Those are solar panels that will be there and on other structures on the campus. All right, just um, one more thing, our carbon footprint. Got to throw some numbers up there for you analytics, analytical types. Um, our carbon footprint, 33.8 million metric tons or so. Um, and I want you to just look at where that happens. The vast majority of it, about 70%, is in our manufacturing sector. And um, uh, if you know anything about us as a company, most of that means in our supply chain with our supply chain partners, i.e. not at facilities that are owned by Apple. So what we've said is that we want to take responsibility for the entire supply chain of Apple products. So um, Tim has said that that is where we have to make our next set of innovations. How do you cut carbon emissions in factories that do business for us, but also do business for other people, uh, and that you know we do not own um, and, and operate. So watch this space. Um, we've been working really hard there um, and will continue to do so. And the second thing I want you to notice is this green part, this, um, the second largest piece. It actually says product usage. That's not Apple at all in a way, although we take responsibility for it. It's, it's you. <laughs> Hopefully you own our products. It's the energy you use over the lifetime of the product once you purchase it. Um, why do we do that? Well, a couple of reasons. If you don't measure it, you don't know um, what's going on. Second reason, taken really largely, if there was no Apple and you didn't buy a product, this energy wouldn't be being used. And so we feel like it, you're, you're using it. Our customers use it because they have our products. But third, it goes towards the fact that if you don't measure it, then you can't do anything about it. So how do we do something about the energy that you use well, that's the story of energy efficiency at Apple. Um, this is actually um, the Mac, the iMac in sleep mode from 1998 till today. Um, in 1998, you can see it used about 35 watts when it was sleeping. And today it uses, that, that number is actually high, it's gone down, but let's use it for now, about 0.9 watts. Uh, in fact, today, Running an average load, it runs between 35 and 36 watts. So it's fair to say today it uses about the same amount of energy working as it did in 1998 sleeping. So now think about that kind of equation changing. And you can see through generations how it's being cut, usually by half. Um, think about that multiplied by the millions of products we sell, and you start to see how you can impact that, that number with energy efficiency just alone. You also get a sense of resources, how much more resource efficient we are. Um, since 2008, on an energy side, we've uh, decreased energy usage by about 57%. Um, if you think Energy Star, which is an EPA program, so I like to use it, um, our notebooks are about almost four times the Energy Star standard, um, and our um, desktops are about 4.2 times the Energy Star standard. Um, about 97% material reduction in that photo, as you can see. All right, we spent a lot of time on climate. I just want to finish up here on um, our other priorities, toxics. If you knew me at EPA, I care a lot about toxic chemicals. Um, I just think that um, toxics are showing up in our products and our processes, um, and we don't know nearly enough about them from a scientific perspective. 
Um, but Apple's been a leader in this section of the industry for a long time. And I want to make it clear why. It's not so much because of our customers. We care deeply about them. But it's about the people um, like this person um, who are making our products. If you can reduce toxins from the products or from the processes, then that's, you, that's a concern you don't have to worry about. This is the most beautiful power cord picture ever. Um, <laughs> I just love it. Um, and it's there to give me a second to talk to you about one example of what it takes to really remove a toxin from a product. Uh, years ago, Apple decided to remove halogenated compounds from all of our products. Um, cores are generally made with PVC, polyvinyl chloride, and chlorine is a halogen. Uh, so that means we had to get rid of the PVC in the power cords. That means we had to find non-brominated, -bro non non-chlorinated thermo elastomers that were safe enough to carry electricity um, over many years and could be certified as so. It took years for Apple to do that. We're now certified um, with those PVC-free power cords in 40 regions around the world. Those cords are also phthalate-free. Our touch screens are arsenic-free. Uh, BFRs, the brominated flame retardants that have been so much in the news, Apple years ago took out of our enclosures. Um, we use metal, uh, metal hydroxides and other uh, compounds to uh, ensure that um, our circuit boards and our cases and um, our enclosures are uh, BFR free. Um, I don't really, I don't know of another company that does more, does it better, but we still have tons to do. And the last one is kind of really interesting. Um, Watch this space too. It's the whole idea of the circular economy. Maybe some of you have started to study that in, here in a school like Haas. I know you think about sustainability all the time, but we make a lot of stuff. We make a lot of products, and that means we use a lot of raw material. We've all seen or heard some of the concerns around electronic waste. Actually, that's not our big concern at Apple. For a long time, Apple's led the industry in collecting used electronics and then auditing our recycling chain to make sure that they're recycled properly, that they're not finding their way accidentally into a landfill or into a dump somewhere where they're unregulated. That part continues, and we have to continue to be vigilant. You have to grow recycling um, vendors around the world and audit them, all of which we do. This is actually a used electronics recycling day in Australia that we had last year. We sponsor them. We probably sponsor them here at Berkeley. Um, we rarely, as you can tell, this is pretty representative, we rarely get our own products back. We know that's going to change as our products are longer and longer in commerce. Um, and so we want to be ready not just to take them back, not just to ensure that they're recycled, but to really push the envelope on what it means to begin to move towards circularity, to take the materials that are used in these. And right now, we can definitely recycle the glass. We can recycle the aluminum. We can recycle a lot of the plastic materials that are on the inside um, and other materials that make up um, the major components, but we're really interested in how we go to the next step, how we get those back into commerce, how we upcycle um, and um, ensure that materials are being used for their highest and best purpose uh, whenever possible. So we're spending a lot of time and energy there. All right, um, that's my cue that I'm just about done and we will have time for a few questions. Um, I just, I just want to sum up, though, because I'm not going to have your bright minds for much longer, um, and just remind you of what's really important. I do think that following the passion that you have, whatever it might be, is incredibly important because you bring that um, to wherever you end up. Um, and you can bring it to whatever kind of company you end up for, bring in thoughts of how to um, challenge the idea that doing right by the environment, being more sustainable, somehow is going to cost the bottom line. It certainly hasn't been the case um, at Apple. Um, I think the beauty of doing better or, ask, or saying that we want to leave the world better than we found it is sort of this iterative process of constantly thinking about what matters. So I, I will give you a few thoughts, but I promise you they'll probably change in a year because I'm constantly thinking about it too. But um, I do think that um, there's a lot of effort to have businesses have a big voice on this issue. But when I ran the EPA, one of the things I'm, I wanted most was examples. You know, regulators actually follow innovation quite often. And so if there are examples of companies that are doing it and doing it well, 
um, that can be as important and, uh, my personal opinion, more important than big speeches or lots of talks or um, things like that. You know, no one can say you can't build a 100% renewable data center. It's right there. It's right there times, you know, four, five, six. So let's not have the discussion of whether it can be done. Let's talk about why it's so important to do it. Um, you know, I think we need to go beyond what's required and ask ourselves what's possible. That's what uh, Apple's known for, innovation. That's what this area is known for, uh, is innovating our way out of um, challenges. I also think government is shrinking. I think there's uh, no scenario I see where there's suddenly going to be a huge influx of money. Um, and so more and more, going beyond what's required is actually going to be the right thing to do because the requirements are going to shrink or they're going to be harder to enforce. Um, I do believe innovation is a huge competitive advantage. I believe generating your own power and knowing how much you're going to pay for it years and years and actually decades into the future is... Um, we're probably underestimating economically how uh, important that will be. I think using less energy is important. I think using less material is so wise, so smart. And I do think the circular economy holds the key. Um, but I also don't think we can be naive about the, the technological challenges that we're going to have to get from where we are to real circularity along the way. Now, we are pretty happy to compete. This is the ad we ran last year um, around Earth Day. It was during some of our um, well-publicized uh, trials with um, some of our competitors. But we thought we'd be a little bit cheeky and just say, you know, there are some ideas we want every company to copy, along with um, a picture of our data center. And that's what you're going to have to think about as you enter the business world. You know, wh whatever company you, are, you end up at, what's your equivalent of getting that data center built and done? What's your equivalent of taking the PVC out of the cord? What's the challenge that you set before the company so no one else can say that it can't be done? Uh, my son is a student in college. He goes to Michigan. Um, and um, he sent me a message not too long ago. It's getting, getting to be a while. He had a friend, Vikram, who um, saw that Greenpeace was giving Apple real kudos over our clean energy investments. And um, his note said, tell your mom, I said, congrats on making a difference in the world by spearheading good policy in the corporate world. Policy in the corporate world. You know, I came from being a policymaker, and yet um, here is somebody, and I think rightfully expecting that we don't stop making policy because we're in the so-called private sector. We are public servants, and in many cases, the tables have turned and business is expected to lead. Um, and I think government, and in my opinion, customers will clearly follow. Um, that's our responsibility. It doesn't just stop with the love canals of the past. It doesn't just stop with um, communicating with our customers. And it includes getting financial return for our shareholders and getting certainty for them as well. Um, it includes freeing up innovation um, in the service of doing better. And it really does leave a chance for us to um, leave it better than we found it. Okay, thanks. All right, so we have just a few minutes for questions. There's two mics here. I'd ask you to cu cluster, come, come up. We'll get through as many questions as we possibly can. Christina from the Center for Responsible Business. Um, thank you so much for your talk. And um, question I have for you. So uh, we are in the business of writing case stories and consuming them. So first off, we'd love to um, tell some of your stories. In particular, I, I found it intriguing what you said early on about how your group is structured. And this is something that um, students are really intrigued about. So you mentioned a centralized sustainability team versus sort of integrated throughout the company. So maybe you could share a little bit about how that changes your role and your thinking as a leader and how, how that's effective at Apple. Yeah, um, and it depends on the company. So I'm just going to speak from experience at Apple. And I'm going to give you the quick answer and then <coughs> encourage you to email me. And um, I'm happy to talk to you a lot more about it. Um, we could have gone either way. And in fact, on my second day of work, I had lunch with Tim. And I said, you know, what do you want me to do <laughs> now that I'm here? 
And he sort of said, you know, you tell me. Um, you know, go out and learn who we are. And in the process of learning who we are, and Apple really is a pretty think different kind of a place. Uh, Nadine just joined us, so she can nod and say, yeah, we think different. Um, it's a very flat organization when you think of the size and scope of Apple, and it's a very relationship-driven company. Um, and so when we looked at those two things together, and then we looked, a lot of the things I talked about, I didn't do in the last two years. So they were things that were, were happening, but weren't joined into not just the story, but a strategy. When I thought about that, um, it seemed to me that it would be a mistake to take the people out of the units where they were able to accomplish this level of work, all to come work for me and sort of learn a, a different way. I didn't, I didn't see the need for it. Now, part of it could also be that I've, I've had my time managing large, large organizations. I really like it, but um, where I am, I think the biggest thing I can do is help think, think through and make those connections across Apple. So just to give you a couple of examples, we have a whole supplier responsibility team. They are embedded in our operations function. Um, and then I sort of work with them to make sure we're challenging ourselves to be as aggressive as we should be in terms of setting our goals um, for that program. We have a, an energy team which sits in facilities. We have an environmental technology team which sits in product design. Um, and so when you think across, and we have a corporate recycling team that actually, interestingly enough, sits in our facilities group as well because they grew out of the, the kind of recycling you do at an at a office building and then they just grew, they continued to grow until they, I think, run the world's best electronics recycling and take back program. So um, we do have people around the world. I do have a team of about uh, 20 plus people around the world who keep an eye on the ever growing and don't underestimate it number of environmental regulations, especially outside the US. Um, and those are changing by the day. Okay, sorry. Phenomenal presentation and thank you for coming to Berkeley Haas. My name is Indy Nelson, I'm a student here, uh, senior here at, at Haas. Uh, as your team set an objective date for when the slogan, most valuable, carbon neutral, global company will come true. <laughs> most valuable, carbon neutral, global company. Oh, so you want to add the carbon neutral. Um, <laughs> 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 um, you know, I, I think we have said the following, and this is another thing that I actually really love about Apple. Apple is very, um, we're very hesitant to make big promises and set big goals and then come back and explain what we could or couldn't do. Um, it, it goes back to this idea of surprising and delighting customers with products. So it's sort of in the DNA of the company that you work really hard on something and then one day you have this moment where you say, look, it's ready for us to share. It's right. We think it's, it's right. Um, so we have resisted up until now saying, you know, here's the timetable by which we'll get to neutrality. And I think even if you said, well, I disagree with that, which I think some people could, could very well do, other companies have taken a different approach, I'm not there yet in being able to set a date that I know we can meet. I think there's going to be um, a couple of things we have to learn how to do really well in the supply chain. And so that will be key to it. So I don't have a date for you yet. In the back. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Francis Chang, second year full-time MBA student. I'm really inspired by your servant leadership and also your um, kind of your, your drive to do what's right. Um, and then, and you're also your question of what's possible. But I think here at the business school, we ask a lot of times what's profitable. Um, and so I would like you to sh kind of share your experience um, in that kind of just position of what's right and what's profitable. And yeah. how have you been able to push what's right versus what's profitable? <sighs> Well, a lot of the decisions you saw, I wasn't around at the very beginning. Um, I will tell you this, on the energy projects that we do, there are none of them that are not profitable. They might not be wildly, insanely profitable, but they're profitable. Um, we are generally able to beat the cost of brown power. Um, and we were talking about this earlier, but a lot of that is because the price of renewables is going down. Um, not just the capital cost, I mean the capital cost, and of course the, the operating cost of renewables is really low compared to having to figure out how to get the fuel and ship it and clean up the emissions when you're done. So 
um, it's pretty easy to, to look at the operating costs and see how they're comparable or lower. And so now you have to figure out the capital costs. Um, we do have the ability to make investments because we have money um, that allows us to do it. Um, on the toxic side, that's probably the area where you could argue that's done because we believed we should do it. Um, a lot of regulation has come up alongside it or actually after um, so that now, especially in Western Europe with the REACH program, um, which I'm sure some of you study in the Roth program, a lot of those things, but not all of them, are now mandated or mandatory in some way. So um, profitable there is really a compliance cost. Um, and then on the recycling front, I think there the possibilities are really endless. And we have, we have work to do on the technology side before we're there. Um, right now, we definitely, we use really good quality material in our enclosures. We use aluminum. It's easily recycled and it has a value. Um, so you can see that from the recycling process, you can get money back. But what we'd like to do is perfect a cycle where, um, how do I say it? Um, what, what happens in recycling is that you sort of make the market. I mean, you can see that with the recycling that happens in this area. Because so many um, organizations mandate, so many municipal governments mandate a high rate of diversion from landfills, businesses come in, they know they have every day, I'm going to get tons and tons and tons of waste, and my job is now to figure out how to keep that from going for a landfill. So the private sector comes in once it knows there's, there's a certainty of input because then they have something to work with. That's what has to happen on recycling for electronics, too. There has to be a market that forms knowing that all this used material is going to come in and it's going to be required to be recycled. And that, I think, is where if we can get a couple of technological innovations along with regulatory requirements, it'll be quite profitable. You'll actually see um, job growth around recycling, I think. Okay. But this is the last question. So no pressure. <laughs> Got to make it good, though. Hi, my name is Tiffany Polk. I'm from CalPERS. Um, it was a pleasure to um, see you, you at the annual meeting the other day and also hear Tim Cook talk about everything that you guys are doing in renewables. Yeah, cool. um, simple, quick question. Um, in your opinion, do you think that the upcoming United Nations Climate Change Conference is going to be a game changer? I hope so. <laughs> um, I no longer have the inside track on knowing, but um, I will say that, um, you know, the thing, there were a bunch of things that everyone said had to happen to see some real progress uh, in Paris in December. Um, and one of them was that China had to decide to um, um, embrace the global challenge and be part of the solution and not, um, not simply look for uh, economic help to do that. And that happened. And that was huge, really huge. Um, I think the United States um, being in a position of leadership, and I know um, this sounds cliche, it, it just would, nothing would have changed if we went in without um, the ability to see our way to meet the goals that President Obama has set. So we now know that right now, soon, the U.S. is going to be submitting its plan for how we're going to get to that number. So a game changer? Yeah, I think so. The thing about regulation is that there's never a moment, I mean, when you pass a new law, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the euphoria that happens, I wish I had been there for one of those, like, in the room. But regulation is different. It's incremental. And it usually lags and follows. Um, I do think just because of the amount of CO2 we're putting in the air right now and the time it's going to be in there, we're all going to have to be um, thinking about adaptation and climate risk to... Um, economies for a long, long time. But if we don't get on the path with a world that's sort of focused on addressing this problem, and hopefully that's what Paris will do, um, we'll be that much worse off. So, yeah. All right. Lots of really interesting concepts. Thank you, Lisa. The couple that stood out for me, the concept of additionality, uh, adding not only to benefit Apple, but also to benefit where you are at the time. Um, policy making from inside a company. Yeah, That's a good one. Um, and then, of course, the one that we, we hear a lot, but I, it can only be, can never be said too often, is leaving the world better than we found it. So. 
Thank you so very much Thanks. for joining us today. We're, we're delighted pleasure. to have had you here. Thank Thanks. you all for being here. and uh, Enjoy think, spring break. Yes. Not too much. <laughs> Not too much.